Samuel chapter 2, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12. Jim, thank you for leading us in worship. It's uh, good to worship with him leading and Linda on the piano. Appreciate that brass ensemble this morning. Uh, appreciate him filling in in Drew's absence. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12. Uh, crowd's a little light this morning because fall break, I think. So about half the church is out and about. Um, we should pray for them. Uh, but um, through the years, I've kind of enjoyed these uh, holiday Sundays when a lot of people are out and it's a little smaller group. And uh, I've experienced the Lord doing special things on days like this. So uh, I trust he'll do that today for us. Um, so I've titled this sermon, The Worthless and the Wonderful, it, uh, it sets up contrasts. We've been having that really all the way through this book so far. Uh, the contrast begins to shift a little bit in this part of the story. Uh, and really what we have in 1 Samuel is the Lord responding to the need of his people. Uh, this past week, in my time with the Lord, I was reading through the book of Numbers, and uh, late in the book of Numbers, I believe it's chapter 27, uh, the Lord tells Moses that he's not going to get to go into the promised land. He tells him to go up Mount Pisgah, look over the Jordan River, and uh, see the land flowing with milk and honey, but he's not going in because he, because he sinned. And uh, Moses immediately jumps from that reality, uh, the Lord really thwarting his fondest desire to intercession for the people of God. And he, he's concerned about how it's going to go for them when he's gone. And he asks the Lord to provide a leader for them so that they would not be harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. You can jump ahead to the New Testament and hear in Matthew's gospel and I think in Mark's as well, uh, describing Jesus looking on the multitudes, having compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. You, uh, in this part of the story today, we're gonna get a snapshot of uh, what harassed and helpless looks like when uh, the leaders are not what they're supposed to be. Um, and yet at the same time, the Lord is doing some reversing. The, the song of Hannah starts to be worked out in this story. What she sang and prayed and even prophesied starts showing up immediately in the raising up of one and the bringing down of others. And in the raising up, God is providing a shepherd for his people so that they will no longer be harassed and helpless. And the God who inspired Moses' prayer asking for that has been faithful to do that generation after generation after generation. And its greatest fulfillment, its chief fulfillment is in what we have in, in the gospel. So, with those things said, let's, uh, I didn't give you a lot of time to sit, did I? But let's stand in honor of the word of the Lord, if you're able, and read our text, 1 Samuel 2, 12. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. The custom of the priests with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand, and he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is what they did at Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Moreover, before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. 
And if the man said to him, let them burn the fat first and then take as much as you wish, he would say, no, you must give it now. And if not, I will take it by force. Thus, the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord, for the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy clothed with a linen ephod, and his mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, may the Lord give you children by this woman for the petition she asked of the Lord. So when they would ret- then they would return to their home. Indeed, the Lord visited Hannah, and she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. And the boy Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. Now Eli was very old, and he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all Israel, and how they lay with the women who were serving at the entrance to the tent of meeting. And he said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of, you, of your evil dealings from all these people. No, my sons, it is no good report that I hear the people of the Lord spreading abroad. If someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. Let's pray. Father, teach us full obedience from these verses And not only teach us, Lord, but give us the grace to live it out. And we know that grace comes from the one who obeyed you perfectly and fully, never failed in any way, and then died in our place on the cross. May streams of mercy flow from him today to all of us for our good and for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. You can take your seat. So the title is the outline today, The Worthless and the Wonderful, and we'll start with The Worthless, The Worthless, and you get it there in the very first verse of our text. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. So of both sides of this sermon, The Worthless and the Wonderful, we're going to ask three questions, and as we answer those, we'll unpack the truth from this story. So first, with the worthless, the first thing we want to ask is, who? Who? Who are these men? Now, uh, the sons of Eli were introduced to us earlier, way back in chapter 1, verse 3, and it just says this, uh, uh, Elkanah would go up year by year from his city to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. So the first thing we know with the who is, who are they? They're priests of the Lord, their sons of Eli. You get that in chapter 1, verse 3. You get that again in chapter 2, verse 12. They're priests. But then it says they were worthless men. Now, that phrase, worthless men, is something that you see in the Bible not real often, only in the Old Testament, but you see it a few times. The first time you find it in the Bible is in Judges chapter 19. And then Hannah used it in her conversation with Eli back in chapter one, uh, when she said, don't consider me a worthless woman. Uh, Don't look at me like that. Um, And then here the third time in all of scripture, now the sons of Eli were worthless men. In, in the Hebrew, the, the phrase literally is sons of Belial, sons of Belial. You, you get it here, you get it in Judges 19. In, in Judges 19, sons of Belial is used as, as a descriptor of the men of Gibeah. You may remember the story when the, this man whose concubine had run off, he goes to fetch her, he brings her back, and they, 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 they leave late in the day because her daddy wouldn't quite let go of her. And he gets frustrated, leaves late in the day. Uh, He can stop in a city, but he wants to go to an Israelite city. So he moves on to go to Gibeah. And there he's taken into the home of an older man. And great just horrors happen in the story. I'm not going to tell you all of it, but it's chilling and terrible. And basically, the men of the city 
crowd against the door of this older man. And the story then becomes very much like the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and the angels there. So if you remember that story, this one not quite as familiar. You can maybe use your imagination and recall what happens or just as your Lord's Day observance, you can read the story from Judges 19. But those men who crowd at the door up to no good, they're called sons of Belial. And here in verse 12, literally the Hebrew just says, sons of Eli, sons of Belial. It, it, it's, it, it's an unbelievable uh, placing side by side. Sons of Eli, the priest of God, are sons of Belial. And the rendering is right. It, it is saying they are worthless, but the idea moves forward all the way to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15, where Paul is telling the Corinthians to not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And he gives a list of things that just contradict, that don't work. And among them, he says, and what accord is there between Christ and Belial. So it becomes even a reference to Satan. These men are worthless. They're priests, but they're sons of Belial. They're worthless men. That's the, that's the who. Uh, Hophni and Phineas. Well, let's go to the what. So what are they doing? And you get really two different things going on here. Now, you just need to know a little bit about the way Hebrew storytelling works and just Hebrew literature works. And there's a, there's a tendency to highlight things by the way you structure a story. And so as I read through it, I don't know if you noticed it or not, but you have the, the sins of Hophni and Phinehas, and then you have in the middle uh, this picture of, of uh, Samuel ministering before the Lord, and then what do you have next? You have the sins of Hophni and Phinehas again. And so uh, the, the Bible will highlight something by the way it flanks it. And here it's flanked, highlighting uh, the, the beauty of who Samuel is and is becoming, flanked by and contrasted by the wickedness of Hophni and Phinehas. So uh, you just, Pay attention to these things when you're reading your Bible. It'll help you understand what the Holy Spirit is emphasizing in the way the story is told. So, what are they doing? Well, the first thing, you get this, this notion of the custom of the priests in that day. Now, I've been reading through Old Testament law at the same time I've been working on 1 Samuel. It's just kind of where I am in my Bible reading. And I've not found this described anywhere other than here. I don't see anywhere in Leviticus or Numbers or Deuteronomy or Exodus describing this three-pronged fork plunged into the boiling meat and getting what you can out of it. I, and it doesn't say the word of the Lord said that. It just says it was the custom. Pretty sure it wasn't a good one. But what you do find in the law is that the priests did get a portion. They had their due from the offerings and they were to have the breast and the right thigh. And that's what they were to get to eat. But this is nothing about breast and right thigh. This is in addition to that. I, I would guess the priest servants got pretty good at uh, reaching in there with a the three-pronged fork and getting more and much and the best. They knew how to spear it just right to get Hophni and Phinehas all that they're hearts or maybe I should say their stomachs des desired. This was a custom. I don't think it's a biblical custom at all. And then verse 15, the ESV says, moreover, it, 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 it's, it's like saying this, not only did they do that, but they also did this. As if it weren't bad enough to do this horrible custom, not being contented with the breast and the right thigh, but having to have more and more. Not only did they did that, but they but did they do that, but they also did this. They would say, "Give us meat for the priest to roast, 
He doesn't want boiled meat. He wants raw meat. And the worshiper would often say, let them burn the fat first and then take as much as you wish. He would say, no, you must give it now, and if not, I will take it by force. You see, the fat was the Lord's portion. It was to be burnt up. And you remember that phrase that runs through Leviticus so often, a pleasing aroma before the Lord? And so Hophni and Phinehas were demanding that they get their portion before the Lord gets his portion. And even they were stealing the Lord's portion. And then we get this descriptor. Thus the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord, for the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. Now a couple of things we should think about here. One is this, that this was very great sin. So sometimes I hear people say things like, all sin's the same, none of it makes any difference, or or none of it's worse than the other, all sin is the same. There's a sense in which that's true. Any sin can send you to hell. One sin is enough. Just one. Apart from the grace of God, one sin will damn you. It it will. Uh, A great, small any of them. There's a sense in which they're all great, but the Bible will use adjectives on sin sometimes. So this notion that all sin is the same, little or great, there's no difference. Yes, in the sense that it means you fall short of the glory of God and you need redeeming grace or you're going to go to hell. It's the same in that sense, but in another sense, no, God doesn't see all sin the same. He doesn't. And you don't either. And you shouldn't parent like this. I mean, should you parent like this and treat some really small infraction the same as you would an out and out obstinate lie where the truth is denied or some willful disobedience you don't you don't parent like that we shouldn't police like that should we of course not god's god of justice all sin is not the same this was very great sin in the eyes of the lord and you should be aware of that and we should think about that corporately too all sin is not disqualifying but some some sins are and we need to have enough discernment to know the difference that's not the main thrust here but you don't get this every day of the week when you're reading through your bible and so when you do get it you ought to linger over it a little bit and think of the implications of it this sin was very great in the eyes of the lord and then he says why for the men treated the offering of the lord with contempt They were despising the offering of the Lord. Now, now the offering of the Lord is the only way that a man or a woman or a boy or a girl can be made right with God. There is no forgiveness of sin apart from the offering of the Lord. And if you despise The only remedy there is, then what hope will there be for you? And the answer is there's there's no hope. If you listen to the words of Hebrews chapter 10, these are some of the hardest words you'll find anywhere in the Bible. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. What's the source of that vengeance and that Holy Spirit being outraged? It's trampling underfoot the blood of the Son of God. 
It's treating what is most precious as worthless. The offerings in the Old Testament all pointed forward to that. And so to treat those Old Testament offerings with contempt is tantamount treating God's provision of grace and mercy with contempt. And it goes forward, it echoes forward to Jesus. All those offerings were aiming at him, pointing forward to him. This was great sin. Then, not only that, but let's jump ahead past the middle uh, to the other flank here in the story. Verse 22, now Eli was very old and he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all Israel and how they lay with the women who were serving at the entrance to the tent of meeting. And he said to them, why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all these people. So not only were they uh, abusing the people of God, were they uh, treating with contempt the offering of God, but they were also abusing the women who served at the temple. You find this reference to these women in Exodus 38 verse 8. Um, I didn't, to tell you the truth, I didn't remember it studying this, but there it is, 38.8. There were women. I think we could, I think we could presume that there are virgins serving at the temple. It doesn't say that, so I don't want to overstate, but I think, let's just say this, I think that would be most likely. And yet Hophni and Phineas are treating them like temple prostitutes. They're behaving like the nations behave. In the Canaanite worship, it would be temple prostitution, which was a part of the worship of a horrible, potent mixture of sexuality and spirituality. And God hates it. And they were violating that. Were the women complicit? We're not really told. Is there a power differential here between the priests of the Lord and the women serving at the temple? Yeah. Is it a small differential? No. <laughs> That's the what. These are priests of the Lord and their sins are great. Abusing God's people, abusing these women but the sins are even more than this. You know, sin is not just about bad stuff that you do that you need to quit. It's also about the good and the beautiful and the true and the right that we're supposed to be doing. And that's especially true of, of leaders. I've been reading a, a book by a church planter. He planted a church in, in Washington, D.C., and he's advocating for a certain type of church planting. The title of the book is Pastoring or Planting by Pastoring. That's the title of the book. And in it, he's talking about how they got started, their church, Restoration Church, I think it is, in Washington, D.C., and uh, they just started meeting in their home with uh, gathering some people and studying the Bible and praying together, talk about what a church meant. And it wasn't a lot of people. It was just like a dozen or a dozen and a half, something like that. I think they covenanted with 18 when they constituted their, their church. And, uh, and, and in the book, he kind of muses a little bit, just thinking, why are these people coming? And to, to some extent, he gives honor to the Lord. They're coming because the Lord is drawing them. But when he, when he described how the Lord was drawing them or why the Lord was, or what the Lord used to draw them, maybe I should say. He said, these people genuinely believed that we wanted something for them, not something from them. Now, that's exactly contrary to Hophni and Phinehas, isn't it? 
They're not leading at the temple to provide something for the people of God. They're, they're leading at the temple to provide something for themselves. It's not about the Lord. It's not about the people. It's about them. And I would just say both of these issues are about bodily appetites, aren't they? Sounds very much like Paul's condemnation of some in, the, in his letter to the Philippians where he says those whose God is their stomach. I'd rather have roasted meat than boiled meat, wouldn't you? So why not change up the order? Because my body wants roasted lamb not boiled. And then in the latter flank, we have another kind of bodily appetite, don't we? And whatever my body wants, my body ought to get. Right? Isn't it amazing how these ancient texts speak to modern issues? Obey your thirst, of course. What else is there to do? If there's a bodily urge, then there's got to be a fulfillment for it. And however you want to fulfill it, fulfill it. There is a fulfillment for it. All these things are made for our enjoyment. But there are boundaries around those enjoyments. And the Lord draws the boundaries for our good. These guys didn't care about that. And just say a word about parenting, and particularly parenting sons. These two bodily appetite temptations discipline them at the table when they're little boys so that they learn to beat their body and make it obey them so that a little later when stronger appetites show up, they will have already learned my body doesn't always have to have what my body wants. Does that make sense? It really matters. That's the who and the, and the what. And they are worthless. Let's spend some time on the why. The why. Well, at some level, you get it in verse 12. Now, the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. They didn't know the Lord. Well, why are they worthless? They, they don't know God. Why are they slaves to their bodily appetites? Why are they abusing others for their own pleasure? They don't know God. And when you don't know God, you, that's about all you're left with. Why didn't they know him? And how do you know him? Well, in some ways, the question is answered later in the story. And, and as I'm immersing myself in Samuel in these days and have been since July, it's almost like the whole book comes flying at you all at once. In every story, everything comes at you. But in chapter 3, we're going to get that question answered. Verse 7 of chapter 3, Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. So the second phrase defines the how of the first phrase. He didn't yet know the Lord. How would he know the Lord? The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. He would know him by the word of the Lord being revealed to him. And then maybe even a little more closely in verse 21. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. But they, they didn't have any of that. The lamp of God is almost out. A word from the Lord is rare in these days. And Hophni and Phinehas certainly didn't get a word. And so... They didn't know God. Do you know God? 
It, it, it's the most important thing for you. You may desire to have a good marriage, be successful parents, make your mark in the world, do something for God. None of that rivals this question, do I know God? It's what you need more than anything else. Nothing else even comes close to it. Do you know him? Remember the verses at the end of Jeremiah chapter 9, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises steadfast love and righteousness and justice in the earth, for in these things I delight. Probably not a perfect quote, but that's definitely the gist of it. Do you know God? How will you know him? Uh, Chapter 3 answers the question, you'll know him by the word. He'll reveal himself to you in his word. So get in the book. He'll reveal you, himself to you through the word become flesh in his son Jesus Christ who came to show us the Father, who he is, what he's like, what he loves, what he hates, what he's about. This is how you know him. You know him by hearing his voice when you read your Bible. You know him by having his ear. You know him by trusting him and walking with him through every pain and every pleasure of your life. It's a wonder of wonders that we can know him that he loves so much that he wants us to. Hophni and Phineas miss it. They don't know God. I want you to think about this. I want you to think about the horrors of it. They're touching, dealing with holy things every day. Every day they're in contact with the things of God. Every day. Offering the uh, the, the offerings, burning it up, smelling the aroma, sprinkling the blood with hyssop. Every day they're at the altar. They're handling the things of God, and yet they don't know him, and they don't care. Could that be you? Sunday after Sunday, occupying a pew, hearing the gospel preached, reading the word of God, handling holy things so near and yet so far away. Don't let that be you. No, God, he is knowable. Why didn't they know him? I think because they didn't hear. Now, there's play on words there in verses 22 through 25, and you need to see it quickly. Now, Eli was very old. He kept hearing. And then in verse 23, why do you do such things for I hear of your evil deeds? And then verse 24, no, my sons, it is not it is no good report that I hear. And then in verse 25, but they would not listen. But in the Hebrew, you know what it is? Want to take a guess? but they would not hear the voice of their father. Or, yeah. They didn't know God because they couldn't hear. They had ears, but they couldn't hear. The, the, the word here is Shema. It's a huge word in the Old Testament. I don't know, there's a more important word other than the word Yahweh. It shows up in Deuteronomy 6, 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength. Eli's hearing. He hears the report three times. Here's of the evil dealings. Here's of the not good report. 
But is Eli really here? Is it possible that the words from the people of God to this priest actually are the words of God calling Eli to do something about his sons? So I would argue that Eli is hearing, but he's really not hearing. He's hearing in one sense audible words, but he's not responding to what God is saying from what he hears. And then that deaf priest trying to urge his deaf sons, what would you expect? They don't hear the voice of their father. Why? They don't know God. Why don't they know God? Because they don't hear God. Why don't they hear God? For it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. The end of verse 25. You would expect it to say, it was the will of the Lord to put them to death because they did not hear the voice of their father. But that's not the way it reads. They did not hear because it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. What in the world do we do with that? Well, it's in the Bible. And we're Bible people, are we not? And so we believe everything that it says. We serve a God who's sovereign, start to finish over all of it. Does this mean that Hophni and Phinehas are just robots in the hands of a sovereign God? It does not mean that. They're doing exactly what they want to do. They wanted to roast the meat. They wanted to steal the Lord's offering. They wanted to sleep with the women at the tabernacle. They're doing exactly what they want to do. They do not want to heed the voice of their father. And so they refuse to hear him. They're not robots. They're making real choices. They're doing exactly what they want to do. God's absolutely sovereign. We're absolutely responsible. Both are true. What do you do with this? Well, one thing you need to do is look at Hophni and Phinehas and realize that unless the Lord's grace had touched your life, you'd be just like them. There, but by the grace of God go I. And it ought to lead you to wonder at the mercy of God. God is sovereign. And yet you're responsible to repent and believe. You're responsible to hear his voice. You're responsible to listen intently, as the writer of Hebrews says, to pay even more close attention to this gospel. All right, I didn't leave much time for the wonderful, did I? (laughs) But let's spend a little time there. Who is Samuel? Samuel. He's a priest too. He's presented as a priest. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy clothed with a linen ephod, and his mother made him a robe. That's who he is. He's also a prophet. Ephods were uh, were garments that the priests wore, but ephods were also objects that were used to determine the will of God. Samuel is a priest, and Samuel is a prophet. And Samuel is also a Nazarite, right? Because his mom said no razor will ever be used on his head. He's that too. And the Nazarite was the forerunner of Jesus, John the Baptist. Samuel is the forerunner of King David. Who is he? Priest and prophet and not king, but the forerunner of the king. What's he doing? He's ministering before the Lord. Now, you don't have a lot of material about Samuel yet, but all the way through it, he he, he brings him in. The writer brings him in. Uh, End of chapter 1, verse 28, and he worshiped the Lord there. Uh, Chapter 2, verse 11, uh, and the boy was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli the priest. And at the very end of the text, now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. Verse 26. In the middle, you have this little highlighted section. You have uh, Eli blessing Elkanah and Hannah. 
May the Lord give you children by this woman for the petition she asked of the Lord. So then they would return to their home and the Lord visits Hannah. And she conceives and bears three sons, two daughters. And the boy Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. And Elkanah and Hannah pass off the scene. That's the last we hear of them. Don't hear any more about them. And the focus moves from Hannah and Elkanah to their boy Samuel. And while the Lord is bringing down these who thought they would prevail by their might, to borrow from Hannah's song, for not by might shall a man prevail. The bows of the mighty are broken, she prayed, and the bows of these mighty men abusing the worshipers at the temple and abusing the women at the temple Their bows will soon be broken. God's bringing them down and he's raising Samuel up. This barren woman giving birth to this son who grows in stature and in favor with the Lord and with man. Does that sound familiar? Luke 2, 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Wonderful Samuel points to the wonderful grace of God in Jesus Christ. And if you will know God, you must know him. If you will not die in your sins, you must trust this Jesus, the offering of the Lord, who died instead of sinners and who was a lamb without blemish because he had no sin. Samuel points forward to the wonder of God's grace. Do you know it? Do you know him? If not, then repent and believe. Hear his voice. Hear him calling you, hear him drawing you, and go to him and trust him. And those of you that have, this text tells us so much about the kind of leaders God's people do not need and the kind of leaders we should never be. In fact, we should be terrified at the thought that we would be anything like these two. And to what extent we are or have been, it should call the leader of God's people to repentance and a more intent listening to the voice of our good shepherd who loves us and loves his people so much. Let's pray. Father, work in our hearts what pleases you from these words from this story. May we shun what is worthless and evil. May we delight in what is good and beautiful and true, especially in your wonderful son. Would you help us by your spirit to glory in our good, gracious redeemer. Be honored in our response now. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to give